Before we begin today's episode, just a reminder to like, subscribe, and turn on the notification bell if you enjoy this episode. Thirteen-year-old Russell Evans was making his way home from hanging out with friends. Two miles down the road, just a tenth of a mile from his house, a passerby found him lying in the street, severely injured, and calling out for help. Hours later, Russell died as a result of his injuries. While the Spokane police officially ruled his cause of death to be that of a hit-and-run accident, evidence at the scene caused their ruling into question. Desperate for answers, his parents launched their own investigation, finding a number of inconsistencies with the official ruling. Was Russell killed by a hit and run, or was something more sinister going on? Could the teenager have been targeted by someone he knew, or perhaps the victim of a random act of violence? There is also a mystery about the crime scene that night. While Russell called out for help to a mysterious Brian, someone dressed in white was seen fleeing the scene. This is Trace Evidence, Episode 119, The Mysterious Death of Russell Evans. Welcome to Trace Evidence. I'm your host, Stephen Pacheco. Today we examine a mysterious death that stuck in my head ever since I first learned about it more than 20 years ago. Before getting into the case, just a few notes about the show. Trace Evidence is a weekly true crime podcast focused on unsolved murders and disappearances. You can follow the show on social media on Twitter at TraceEvPod, Instagram at TraceEvidencePod, or by searching Facebook for Trace Evidence. The show is also available on MeWe and Minds. If you're interested in supporting the show and getting some Trace Evidence merch, there's a Patreon available at patreon.com slash traceevidence, or you can donate via PayPal. Visit trace-evidence.com for all social media links, donation options, and contact information. You can submit case suggestions directly through the website or email me at traceevidencepod at gmail.com. A 13-year-old boy left dying in the road. Police rule it a hit-and-run accident, but evidence at the scene suggests it may not have been an accident at all. This is episode 119, The Mysterious Death of Russell Evans. It had been an eventful night for 13-year-old Russell Evans, but now it was time to go home. It was just after midnight and Russell had a curfew set for that time. He was going to be late, but always being considerate, Russell picked up the phone and dialed his father, John. Speaking with him, Russell explained that he was going to be walking home from the house of his friend, Aaron Abramson. Abramson lived near the corner of 34th and Freya in the Lincoln Heights area of Spokane, Washington, approximately two miles south of Russell's home, which was located at 825 Thor Street in neighboring East Central. It was a trek Russell had made dozens of times in the past, and while two miles isn't exactly a short distance to travel, Russell had certain advantages which made it a shorter trip. He was in great shape, an avid basketball player who ran and jogged often. Beyond that, at the age of 13, he was already 6 feet 3 inches tall. By most analysis of the trip, it's been average that he would have covered a mile in approximately 15 minutes, making the whole trip in the neighborhood of 30 minutes total. However, on this particular night, Russell never makes it home. Approximately one hour after leaving his friend's house, Russell will be found clinging to life, lying in the northbound lane of South Thor Street along an incline referred to in the media as either Thor Ray Hill or South Hill. Just eight hours later, Russell will pass away as a result of his injuries. What exactly happened that night remains a source of great debate today, and while investigators quickly made a ruling, Russell's parents, friends, and other locals strongly disagreed with the findings. The more details about Russell's evening which were uncovered, the more questions were asked, but the answers were in short supply. Russell Sigurd Evans was born on July 22, 1975, to parents Susan and John. 
Russell had been described as a smart, athletic, and caring teenager who worked hard towards his goals and had big-time dreams. According to his father, Russell, or Rusty as he sometimes called him, excelled at basketball and dreamed of becoming a professional playing for the NBA while also having plans to pursue electrical engineering at his target school, UCLA. Russell played basketball for Libby, which at the time served as a middle school in the area. In the mid-90s, the school changed trajectories, becoming the Libby Center, which focuses on accelerated programs for gifted students. Outside of playing, Russell also worked closely with one of his teachers, assisting with various tasks and plans. Roger Lake, then vice principal of Libby Middle School, told the Spokesman Review, quote, He was a real popular kid in school. He was just a pretty good kid all around. End quote. In the summer of 1988, one year before his death, Russell was invited to attend a National Basketball Association camp to show off his skills and learn to sharpen and hone them. By all accounts, Russell was thrilled at the experience and it truly drove him harder to pursue his dreams. For a 13-year-old, already standing so tall and showing off so much skill, there was a lot of promise. And unlike others who sometimes slack on their work ethic, believing their physical attributes will make the difference, Russell poured his heart and soul into the game. Russell had a lot of friends and seemed to make them easily. His close friend, Aaron Abramson, whose house he was leaving the night he died, told Unsolved Mysteries, quote, He was very well liked. He had a good sense of humor. He got along with pretty much everybody. He had no problems. End quote. In a forum post attributed to Abramson, he recalls long afternoons playing basketball until it got dark and a lot of fun evenings sitting in front of the television playing Nintendo with his best friend. Abramson and Russell were close, and Abramson has said multiple times that Russell was essentially a fixture at his home, coming over most days after school to hang out. Diana, Russell's youngest sister, who was five at the time of his death, told KXLY Spokane, quote, He was very loving, he was a great big brother, and he protected me, end quote. Several articles about Russell go into detail explaining that he had a soft spot for the underdog and a tendency to stand up for those who couldn't stand up for themselves. Being as large as he was, Russell towered over his classmates and a lot of kids in grades higher than him, and when things had the possibility of turning violent, most people reconsidered once they laid their eyes on him. Actually, something very similar took place the very night that Russell was killed, and for many there are questions which still linger about who was involved and how they may have been involved in his death. On Saturday, June 3, 1989, Russell had plans to spend much of his day with friends. Few details are available about the earlier part of the day, though most comments about the day seem to suggest what would be expected. Basketball, video games, just kids hanging out. The full event of the evening, which kicks off the timeline leading into Russell's death, begins at approximately 10 p.m. Russell, along with a handful of friends including Aaron Abramson, Brian Bushing, and Don Hepburn, and others, were all hanging out at Thornton Murphy Park, located off Ray Street at the corner of 27th Avenue, just a few blocks north of Abramson's home. At the time, Abramson and Hepburn were dating, and an incident developed between Russell's group of friends and two other teenagers, apparently revolving around Hepburn. According to reports of the time, the two teenagers were foster brothers, one being 15 and the other 17. Their names have never been released to the public and they gave statements to newspapers under agreements of anonymity. In their account, granted to the Spokane Review, one of the brothers approached Hepburn and flirted with her, ultimately asking for her number. While there are no specifics related to how the situation got out of hand, a shoving match ensued between the brothers and Abramson and his friends. It isn't all that difficult to imagine how teenagers react to a situation involving someone hitting on someone else's girlfriend. According to multiple witnesses later interviewed by police, when the shoving and name-calling got a little out of hand and things seemed to be taking a turn towards a fight, Russell inserted himself into the situation, and depending on whose account you believe, he either stepped between Abramson and the brothers telling them to get lost, or he restrained one of the brothers from getting involved in the altercation telling everyone to break it up. Either way, 
Witnesses agree that the two brothers backed off and made their way out of the park. However, there were several witnesses who later told police that one of the brothers made a comment suggesting he was going to go pick up a few of his friends and come back and fight since they were outnumbered at the time. The two brothers drove off together, presumably with the 17-year-old behind the wheel. Now, I should note that while official accounts place this altercation at the park, a few newspaper articles written at the time place it elsewhere, at a nearby pizza restaurant and the Lincoln Heights Shopping Center. In some articles, it's just referred to as a Lincoln Heights business. However, Unsolved Mysteries, as well as the detectives interviewed for the show and in local papers, all place the altercation at the park. As you might imagine, in the time following the near fight, Russell and his friends were pretty keyed up about the incident and spent a while talking about it before things broke down into jokes. After hanging out in the park, Russell and seven friends apparently headed further south, onto the campus of Ferris High School just off 37th Avenue. According to the Spokane Review, both Abramson and Bushing were part of the group that continued on to the high school. Several articles state that Russell and his friends may have had another altercation, this time with members of a gang which has been referred to as the GQ Gang, which apparently stands for Gangster Quality. Allegedly, members of this gang attended Ferris High School, but the altercation that we know about that night took place in the park, with the two brothers who attended Lewis and Clark High School located five miles to the northeast. So whether or not there was another altercation at the high school, I can't say for sure. However, investigating police would later look into the possibility of Russell's death being related to gang activity. After spending time at the high school, Russell and his friends made their way over to Abramson's house to finish up the evening. Reportedly, they were all still a little amped about what had happened previously at the park and talked back and forth about it. At approximately 12.05 a.m., Russell used the phone to call his father, notifying him that he was going to make his way home. According to a statement in the Spokesman Review, Russell's father went to bed shortly after receiving the call since Russell had a key to the house and could let himself in. According to witnesses at the house, Russell exited and began jogging towards his home. Approximately 10 minutes later, at 12.15 a.m., said Madison, a friend of Russell's who attended Ferris High School, ran into him under a streetlight at the corner of 33rd Avenue and Thor Street. According to Madison, when he came across him, Russell was jogging but stopped to walk and talk for a minute. Russell apparently told Madison that he was making his way home, and he brought up the altercation that had happened in the park. Madison told the Spokane Chronicle that Russell was, quote, all psyched up, end quote. Reportedly, Russell explained that it hadn't been a big deal, but if it had turned into a fight, he'd have jumped in to defend his friend. Russell must have mentioned something about one of the brothers saying he was going to bring some friends back because Madison noted to reporters that he didn't appear to be worried or concerned about any kind of retribution. The two friends traveled along together for approximately four blocks before parting ways near 29th Avenue and Freya Street. According to Madison, the last time he saw Russell, he was jogging along Freya Street heading north. This puts Russell approximately one mile south of his home, which is located 21 blocks to the north on 8th Avenue, sometime between 12.20 and 12.25 a.m. In just over 30 minutes, though, the 8th grader will be found lying in the street, conscious but severely injured. No one knows for certain what transpired over the next 30 to 40 minutes, at least no one who has ever come forward to investigators. There's a lot of theories, a lot of rumors, and a lot of debate. What we do know is that 37-year-old Sandy Ferris lived in nearby Spokane Valley, just a few blocks to the east of Lincoln Heights, and was being driven home by a friend. The vehicle was moving north along Thor Street, heading downhill, when the car's headlights came upon Russell, who was lying in the northbound lane near to a thin concrete median no wider than a curb. The way the roads are laid out, Traveling northbound, South Thor Street intersects South Ray Street on a hill. A grassy hill juts out in a triangle shape where both roads meet and there's a concrete island with a stop sign. Northbound traffic on Thor Street can turn left here, heading south on Ray, or continue onward beyond the island where the roads merge. 
Today, Bethel Christian Preschool and Daycare sits right next to the locations where the roads actually merge. According to Ferris, her friend stopped the car and she immediately jumped out, running towards the 13-year-old as another passerby drove off to call 911. In her own words, Ferris said that it was a bizarre scene. Russell was lying on his back when she reached him. Reaching down, she cradled his head in her lap. She noted that the teenager wasn't wearing shoes or socks, but further down the hill, in the direction Russell lived, she could see both of his shoes and one sock beside what she described to the Spokane Chronicle as pools of blood. Ferris told reporters that upon reaching Russell, he was loudly calling out, screaming, Brian, help me. Ferris later told Unsolved Mysteries that it felt to her like Russell thought this Brian was nearby and was screaming out to him for help as if he expected him to be able to hear him. Ferris tried to calm Russell down and began asking basic questions, what his name was, where he went to school, and Russell was able to answer all of those questions. However, when she began asking what happened, Russell started losing consciousness. Ferris told the Spokane Chronicle, quote, I asked him what happened, and he just looked up at me and didn't say anything. End quote. Paramedics and police quickly arrived on the scene and began treating Russell and preparing to transfer him to Sacred Heart Medical Center, just three miles to the west. Ferris, though, was a little put off by the police at the scene, who she noted didn't try to speak to Russell or ask him any questions. It was during the initial moments of their arrival, when they took over caring for Russell, that she finally glanced around and noticed a young man watching from the nearby hillside. According to Ferris, the young man was dressed in white shorts and a white shirt, making him stand out against the darkness. Just about the time she noticed him, the boy started running up the hill. When Ferris attempted to draw the officer's attention to the boy who was running, she was ignored, later telling Unsolved Mysteries, quote, I tried to tell the policeman a couple of times and he kept telling me to get on the sidewalk. End quote. Ferris, however, was not the only person who noticed the boy. One of the EMTs working the scene also saw this person, dressed in white, running up the hill. When the EMT later gave a physical description to police, Ferris herself was never actually questioned about what she had seen. There were a lot of bizarre details about the crime scene itself and questions about the way investigators processed it, but we'll get to those a little later. When Russell's mother arrived at the hospital, she thought her son had been in a bad fight, judging from the bruising on his face, arms, and hands. Reportedly, there were finger bruises on his nose, face, and upper arms, as well as bruising on his knuckles, which some pathologists believe could be signs of offensive strikes from Russell, possibly trying to fend off an attacker or multiple attackers. Russell had sustained massive injuries, including head injuries, bruised and bleeding kidneys, and he was suffering from internal bleeding. Despite clinging to life for nearly eight hours, Russell Evans passed away at 9.10 a.m. on Sunday, June 4th. Initially, when investigators were asked about what happened, they didn't have a full answer, but they believed it had been a high likelihood that Russell had been killed in a hit-and-run accident. Dr. George Lindholm, the Spokane police's pathologist, would ultimately rule that that was exactly what had happened. During the autopsy, Lindholm discovered that there were no drugs or alcohol in Russell's system. In terms of injuries, in addition to head trauma, kidney lacerations, and other internal injuries, Brian's spine had been broken. The ultimate cause of death was related to a lacerated kidney due to, quote, blunt impact injury to the back, end quote. He later referred to the incident as a classic hit-and-run scenario, at which time the case was transferred to the Spokane Police Department's traffic unit. While the Evans believed this at first, they soon began to have doubts about the ruling. Russell's mother was a registered nurse, and his father had been a cardiopulmonary technologist. Both had medical experience, and in their opinions, the bruising and damage they saw to their son's body simply didn't line up with a hit-and-run. Sue and John told Unsolved Mysteries that there was not a single consistent bruise across Russell's back to signify being hit by a bumper, but instead, quote, the bruising along his back is not even. It's demarcated, showing an irregular pattern. Rather than coming from one object, we believe it came from repeated blows, probably from a baseball bat or two by four, end quote. There was also bruising on Russell's legs. 
Dr. Lindholm disagreed, and so the Evans family hired an independent pathologist to examine the case. Dr. William Eckert was a renowned pathologist who had consulted on several high-profile cases in the past, and he agreed to consult on Russell's. Examining the bruising on Russell's hands, Eckert agreed that they showed signs of offensive strike. Eckert, though, didn't completely disagree with the findings of Lindholm. Instead, he suggested that while Russell may have ultimately been hit by a vehicle, he believed there had likely been a brutal physical altercation which had taken place before that happened and that Russell had likely been beaten before being struck by a vehicle. The major area of damage was to Russell's back, approximately 46 inches off the ground, which would suggest that if those injuries were caused by a vehicle, it was likely some kind of a truck with oversized tires. Dr. Graham McConnell, the county coroner, later told the Spokane Chronicle that he had his own questions about the results of the autopsy, but would keep them to himself until after he consulted with prosecutors. Russell's funeral took place on June 7th, his mother's 42nd birthday. The family was stunned by what had happened, first losing their son, and then questioning the direction of the investigation. Soon, little details began getting back to the Evanses, which made them question things even more. Said Matheson's mother, Sue, was a bus driver for Libby Middle School and told reporters and police that she'd had a conversation with Dawn Hepburn, Abramson's girlfriend, the day after Russell's death. In her account, Hepburn explained that the day before he was killed, Russell was given a note which bore the warning, you'd better watch your back. In Madison's mind, nothing about the hit and run made sense, and it seemed there might be more to the story. While Russell's parents went through his possessions, they were never able to locate that note. However, if it did exist, it would raise other possibilities about someone wanting to harm Russell. While police stood by their belief that this had been a hit and run, they were clear that it was still a criminal act and they would work to track down the driver. In the process of their investigation, the Spokane police took a lot of reports from friends of Russell's who were present in the park the night he died. Following up on their information, they tracked down the two brothers who had been involved in the altercation and questioned them. Both brothers outright denied any involvement in Russell's death. At the time, there were a lot of rumors circulating about their involvement, so each brother volunteered to take a polygraph test. According to the brothers as well as the Spokane police, they passed their tests and were subsequently ruled out as potential persons of interest. In addition to the two brothers, five other individuals were tracked down and questioned. Who these people were has never been made public, and police specified that they would not reveal their names. According to the Spokane Chronicle, of the five who were polygraphed, four passed the examination, with a fifth whose results were inconclusive. Reportedly, one of the vehicles belonging to those who were questioned was examined, but no evidence was found which would connect it to having been involved in Russell's death. Detective Nick Stanley told the Chronicle that, after the examination, the car in question was taken to a junkyard for elimination. When asked about leads and developments in the case, Detective Stanley replied, quote, A lot of it was sheer rumor, no hard evidence. End quote. Spokane police did make several public pleas for anyone with information to come forward, but no one did. Russell's parents, though, continued to push the issue, and as a result, for a period of time, police chief Terry Magnan had Russell's case shifted back to the major crimes unit, retrieving it from the traffic unit who had been given it earlier. While investigators continued to look for potential suspects, John Evans began conducting his own investigation, and he started with Russell's friend, Brian Bushing, who had been present at the park the night Russell died. It was believed by Evans that this may in fact have been the Brian his son was calling out to the night he died, and maybe he could have been the boy seen running up the hill in the aftermath. During the Unsolved Mysteries segment, John Evans quite clearly stated that he went and spoke with Brian. According to him, Brian admitted that he had been with Russell earlier that night. When asked what he had been wearing, Brian allegedly told Evans that he had been wearing white shorts and a white shirt clearly matching the description given by both Sandy Ferris and one of the EMTs who had been working on Russell. However, when police later spoke with Brian, according to Evans, 
He denied owning any such outfit and claimed he had not been anywhere near the spot where Russell had ultimately been killed. Detective Stanley told the Chronicle that despite their sincerest attempts, they had never been able to positively identify the person seen in white that evening. They later stated that it was their belief that the person in white was not connected to the case and more than likely had heard all the commotion and sirens and came down to see what had happened. However, there was another bizarre detail which pointed towards someone named Brian. According to Russell's mother, Sue, when she arrived at the hospital before she got to see her son, she was informed that they had received a call asking about the status of Russell's condition. According to Sue, the caller gave his name as Brian. This raises a few questions, but most predominantly, considering the time the accident happened and that Russell's own parents had only just been notified, how did this Brian who was calling know that Russell was in the hospital or that anything had happened in the first place? This is a question which has never been answered, but over the years, Brian Bushing has received a lot of criticism and forums are flooded with people calling on him to come forward with what he may or may not know. The Evans family felt that the police had not done a thorough investigation into their son's death and requested an independent review of the case. In May of 1990, the city council conducted a review of the evidence and investigation and ultimately ruled that the police had done their best and it was a good enough job in trying to determine what may have happened. As part of their own investigation, the family filed a lawsuit against the Spokane police to force them to release their files for review. At the same time, Unsolved Mysteries began work on their episode which would feature Russell's case. During the pre-production phase, producers requested access to film at the site where Russell had been hit, but were denied a permit to shut down that roadway for filming. As a result, in the episode itself, a different stretch of road is used. Nearly two years passed when finally, in February of 1992, the Evanses won their court case and the police were ordered to hand over all files related to the death of their son. These files, in addition to discussion with Sandy Ferris and police themselves, resulted in the family solidifying their belief that this had not been a random hit and run. There were multiple issues noted with the investigation, particularly the way in which the scene had been handled. There were also details obtained through the files which raised even more questions about what may have truly happened that night. The list of issues with the crime scene itself isn't exactly a short one. First and foremost, police neither photographed Russell nor made any official marking of exactly where he had been found on the road. This information was later gathered when the Evans family spoke with Sandy Ferris and went back to the hill to figure out how everything had appeared that night. To say the scene was strange is basically an understatement. Firstly, Russell was found on the northbound side of the road lying beside the median. In the official report, Russell had been struck in the back, which police argued sent him flying into the area where he was found. The problem the family had with this was twofold. If Russell had been on his way home and was ultimately struck in the back, this would suggest he was facing away from the direction he was traveling at the time he was hit since he was found uphill while his shoes had been found toward the bottom of the hill. In addition to that, to have been struck in the back in the northbound lane, the driver would have had to have been traveling south but on the wrong side of the road. Now, Russell could have easily seen the vehicle coming at a high rate of speed and in a reflexive action turned his back to protect himself, but you'd expect someone who was shot up the hill from a hit and run to have scrapes and cuts related to colliding with the pavement, road rash, so to speak. But Russell didn't have any of those injuries. In terms of his shoes, they also raised a lot of questions. While Russell had been found uphill, his shoes were downhill, 86 feet from the location where Sandy Ferris found him. His left shoe lay furthest away with his right shoe just a few feet closer. Lying in the street were Russell's shoelaces having been torn from his shoes. Strangely, police later argued that the point of impact with the vehicle, Russell might have been rocketed out of his shoes and his laces at that time were separated. There were also three distinct pools of blood found. One, 50 feet away from where Russell was found. The closest was 30 feet. With Russell lying almost on the median, the pools of blood were down the hill between him and his shoes, though one distinct pool of blood was found off to the side of the road near the edge of it. 
One of Russell's shoelaces had blood on it, and one of Russell's socks was lying beside a pool of blood. When the Evans family asked to see Russell's socks, they'd mysteriously vanished. Police suggested the possibility that hospital employees may have discarded them at the time he was rushed into surgery, though the family considers this unlikely, and there's never been any public statement from hospital staff about what may have happened to them. It seems unlikely that the EMTs ran down the road, picked his socks up, and brought them in the ambulance with them. It's the Evans family's belief that Russell's socks may have had blood on them, suggesting that a physical assault may have taken place. If the scene wasn't strange enough already, it was later shown that police had not taken samples of the blood they found in the road and instead had washed the pools away. Police reports also confirmed that investigators never conducted follow-up interviews with Sandy Ferris, who had found Russell that night, or said Madison, the last person to see him alive before the incident. When asked about the way the scene was processed, Detective Stanley told the spokesman review he would have, quote, done a few things differently, end quote. According to Russell's sister, Diana, in an interview from February of this year, there was also DNA evidence found at the scene which, to this day, has never been processed. Met with this evidence and after consulting with several medical experts and a private investigator, the Evans family constructed their own theory of what may have happened. They theorized that while Russell was making his way home, a vehicle approached at a high rate of speed, at which time one of the passengers may have swung a blunt object, either a bat or a 2 by 4 striking Russell in the lower back. At this time, they argued the vehicle pulled over in front of Russell, causing him to turn, attempting to run back up the hill, eventually being grabbed by his assailants who then restrained him and beat him repeatedly. It was argued that judging from the bruising on Russell's hands, he likely got a few shots in before he was subdued and left lying in the road. Whether or not this was an attack specifically targeting Russell, or if it had been a random act of violence, they couldn't say for sure. The Evans family worked with private investigator Sandy Brewer, who in 1996 came forward claiming to have found new witnesses that provided information that Russell had in fact been killed by a group of people. According to tapes recorded by Brewer, a witness reported that another person explained he had gone too far that night and accidentally killed Russell. According to the witness, the individual responsible stated, quote, Man, you know I screwed up. I ended up killing that boy last night. What I did was I hit him. Once I hit him, backed up and ran over him. End quote. According to the witness, several of the killer's friends knew the story and had confirmed that if police came asking about the murder, they would say he had been with them the night it happened and therefore couldn't have been involved. While Brewer stated she tried to make this information available to investigators, there doesn't appear to have been any further investigation conducted. Russell's parents dedicated themselves to finding justice for their son for the rest of their lives. Sadly, in the years that followed, the pressure began to consume John. He slowly developed a substance abuse issue and lost his life in 1998. Thirteen years later, in 2011, Russell's mother Sue passed away at the age of 64. She never accepted what happened to Russell. She never accepted that his killer had never been captured. Sue was buried in Holy Cross Cemetery beside her son. With both of his parents gone, Russell's sister Diana has since taken up their cause and continues to fight for justice for her brother. Five years after Sue passed away, a bizarre post was put up on the Spokane area Craigslist page, which not only referenced Russell's death, but went so far as to name a potential suspect. I'm going to read you the post in its entirety, but it's important to note that this is a Craigslist posting, and in the four years that have passed since, there has never been any information out of the Spokane Police Department about potential legal action or follow-up investigations. The post reads as follows, quote, in 1989, Russell Evans was killed by ex-Ferris High School students. One of them told me he did it, and he graduated from Ferris in 1988. This is how I was told for what happened, which killed Russell Evans. A four-door car full of four 18- to 20-year-old young adults sitting in the backseat of that car was a Darrell, not Darnell, and the killer, Thomas J. Gras. Thomas J. Gras, T.J., 
told me they were driving down the hill and they saw a tall kid walking on the side of the road, and Thomas J. Gras said they wanted to scare the kid. The car pulled up next to Russell Evans, like the Dukes of Hazard, and grabbed a hold of Russell Evans and took off down the hill, holding Russell Evans alongside the car. When the car took off down the hill, holding on to Russell Evans, Russell's long legs went back and under the rear wheel of the car while Russell Evans was being held by Thomas J. Graw through the back window of the car, and Russell Evans' feet were ran over by the rear wheel. This is how Russell Evans' shoe was found at the top of the hill and how the shoe had come off from Russell Evans. At the bottom of the hill, Thomas J. Graw let Russell Evans go, and this is where Russell Evans had died. Remember that Russell Evans was a tall 12-year, that may be thought to be older because of his height. Thomas J. Graw, a year after Russell Evans' murder, had gone to Washington's Walla Walla State Prison for around seven years for an assault charge. T.J. Graw is the murderer who told me he was involved with what is said above. You can even ask T.J. Gras's girlfriend, Holly. I'm sure he told her. Also, if anyone would like to debate me on what I was told, then why don't you first do forensic on the two shoes found on the hill for tire rubber? Or do those shoes exist today in Spokane's unsolved evidence department? Or could it be a cover-up? Because you don't see the reward poster that was in on the wall inside Spokane South Hills Round Table Pizza on Regal Street. Thomas J. Graw showed me that framed reward poster at the pizza place after he said what happened to Russell Evans, end quote. I couldn't find anything about police investigating this post or making any determinations from it. I do know it was given to them. However, there's a posting on an Unsolved Mysteries website from a man alleging to be Thomas Graw. In his post, he stated that he was questioned by authorities as far back as 1997 voluntarily took a polygraph and was cleared by investigators. Despite this, Gra is frequently referenced by internet researchers as having been involved in Russell's death. Regardless, there doesn't appear to be any evidence or legal recourse in response to that post. It is important to note, though, the post is full of errors. Russell's shoes were found at the bottom of the hill, not the top. Russell was found towards the top, not the bottom. Russell didn't appear to have injuries to his lower legs, only his upper legs, which would be inconsistent with his feet and lower legs being pulled beneath the tires. Also, his body showed blunt force trauma to the lower back, not signs that a vehicle's tires had actually run him over. Russell Evans died on June 4, 1989, at the age of 13. Whether this was a targeted attack, an assault followed by vehicular homicide, or a random hit and run, Whoever took his life is still out there. They've gone on to experience all the things he never will. Growing up, spending time with family, pursuing a career. Every little moment so many dismiss as insignificant was taken from him, leaving a family shattered and a town torn by suspicion and doubt. His parents went to their graves never knowing the truth, but there are those who believe justice is coming, and the more time passes, the closer they get to achieving it. In early 2020, Russell's sister Diana was interviewed by KXLY Spokane and made several statements about her brother's murder, her beliefs in what happened, and also her knowledge that the person or persons responsible for Russell's murder may still live in Spokane. In response, she stated, quote, I'm sharing the city with someone who murdered my brother, who was a child, end quote. Diana has taken up the fight, not only for her brother, but for others who have lost loved ones in the area and have never received justice. Throughout the past few years, she has written multiple letters to the mayor, city council, and police requesting that they dedicate further resources to cold cases, as well as unsolved sexual assaults. It's her belief that 30 years later, maybe someone might be ready and willing to talk. Maybe they will no longer be afraid of whoever they didn't want to point the finger at in 1989 when they were teenagers. Diana also seemed to suggest that whoever was responsible is in the case files and that there may be some issues brewing between multiple people related to Russell's death. When asked if she had anything to say to the person or persons who killed her brother, she replied, quote, You know who you are. You know who you were with that night. It's clear from the evidence I've read, you don't trust each other very much. If you are the last to come to the table, your options will be very limited. 
This isn't over. More than one hit-and-run accident occurs every four minutes in the United States. For the most part, it's clear what happened. There's evidence to examine, witnesses, a victim who may only be injured or perhaps has been killed. In many of those instances, investigators are able to make several determinations based on evidence collected at the scene, the type of vehicle, how fast it was going, whether or not there was an attempt to stop. In the case of Russell Evans, however, the evidence which does exist seems to call a lot of that into question, and while police maintain to this day that it was a so-called classic hit and run, there's enough there that even 30 years later there are still doubts and questions which can't be answered. There's a lot going on in this case, and before getting into the actual evidence and theories to break them down, I think we have to look at something else first. At the core of this case is the mysterious Brian. Someone who was kicked up a lot of curiosity and suspicion since that terrible night when Russell Evans was killed. For almost everyone who has examined this case, Brian has become a key facet, and many believe that locating this Brian could provide answers to many of the questions that have been levied, but perhaps most importantly, what exactly happened on the road that night. There's two ways people generally look at this. Either Brian is Russell's friend, Brian Bushing, who had spent some time with him that night, or it's a completely different Brian that no one's ever looked at before, or at least, never made any connections to. In terms of Russell's friend, there hasn't been a lot to work with there. Brian Bushing hasn't said a lot about this case, if he's said anything. I found a few posts online from someone claiming to be Brian, though I can't verify that it's actually him. In those posts, this person claimed that he was not with Russell towards the end of the night, only the earlier half. He pointed out that he was nowhere near what happened to Russell and that Unsolved Mysteries made no attempts to contact him when they filmed their segment. In one of the posts, he claims that he moved out of the area approximately a year after Russell was killed. He stated that Russell was a dear friend who he missed to this day, but he has no knowledge of what happened that night, nor did he have any involvement. In some places, Brian was accused of being a member of a gang that was responsible for Russell's death though in online postings he asserts that he's never been a part of any gang. The information we have to work with is limited. According to Sandy Ferris, Russell was calling out the name Brian when she found him, asking Brian to help him. She stated that the way he was saying it, she believed that Russell thought this Brian was close enough to hear his calls. They weren't just random. She witnessed someone in the bushes of the hill dressed in white watching what was happening who then ran off. An EMT at the scene confirmed this description, and while police never tracked this person down, they were convinced that whoever it was had just been someone looking to see what had happened. Not sure why that person would then run away uphill, but that's an answer we're never given. According to Russell's father, he questioned Brian about what he was wearing that night. John claimed that Brian had described his outfit as a white t-shirt and white shorts, the exact outfit that both Ferris and the EMT reported. However, when authorities went to question Brian, he allegedly said he owned no such outfit and was not in the area when Russell was hit. I don't know what to make of that, honestly. While I want to believe John Evans, I've got nothing beside his opinion to work with, and Brian himself has been exceedingly quiet about everything. I guess the question you have to ask is, if indeed Russell's friend Brian was present, why didn't he call the police? Why did he flee, and why would he later lie to investigators? A lot of scenarios have been worked up over the years. Maybe he was involved in the crime. Maybe he was partly responsible. Maybe he was there, got scared, and ran when police showed up, figuring that there was nothing else he could do. It would make sense if he then called the hospital to check on him. We know a Brian called, but we simply don't know what Brian that is. If it was Russell's friend, it wouldn't make a ton of sense for him to call if he was trying to distance himself from the investigation but we're also talking about young teenagers here, and they aren't the most logical. I'd like to imagine that if Russell's friend Brian was there that night, he'd have done more than just watch from the woods. I mean, you have to realize, we don't know exactly what time the incident took place, but we do know that Sandy Ferris arrived at 105. That would mean, for some period of time, this person would have been watching Russell lying in the street, injured and dying, crying out for help, and doing nothing about it. That's a pretty tough thing to do to someone who's supposed to be one of your friends. I suppose only Brian Bushing knows for sure whether or not he was there, 
whether or not he was the one who called the hospital. Then, there's the possibility that it was an entirely different Brian altogether. Someone else Russell knew by name. It seems unlikely that Russell is going to be calling out to help for someone who may have been involved in what happened to him. So it seems a safe bet that the Brian Russell was calling out to was someone he would expect to help him. Was this the person watching from the hill or was that some bizarre coincidence? Were authorities right and this was just someone who came down to see what happened and then left the scene when it looked like everything was wrapping up? The only person who could answer that question is the person himself. If you were just there to see what happened and then you learn police are looking for you to find out what you saw, why not come forward? Maybe you're scared or maybe you were involved. There's really no way to know. However, if you're concerned enough to pick up a phone and call the hospital, then you had to have known what happened. You had to have been there or seen it. Remember, Russell's mother was told about the call when she got to the hospital. How could anyone else have known about it yet unless they were present when it happened? In a post online, the so-called Brian Bushing claimed that he didn't learn about Russell's injuries until approximately 5 a.m. That doesn't explain someone calling as early as 1.30 a.m. A part of me also feels it's important to note that Russell, if he was struck by a vehicle or even beaten severely, there's a good chance his head trauma could have been causing issues with cognitive function. Is it possible he was calling out the name Brian, not expecting Brian to be there, but he was just in a haze? Ferris claims Russell was lucid enough to give his name and where he went to school. I don't know, it all seems too coincidental, but I'd be interested in hearing your thoughts on it. I will say this, Brian, if you're listening, I would love the opportunity to talk to you about this case on or off the record. Looking at the crime itself, it isn't all that difficult to imagine why police came to the conclusion of a hit and run. Russell sustained massive injuries to his lower back and upper legs, approximately 46 inches off the ground. It was determined that this was above the height of a car's bumper and likely belonged to a truck with oversized tires. So in their theory, Russell was either walking downhill in the northbound lane when he was struck by someone driving the wrong way, possibly drunk, or he was in the process of crossing the street when the vehicle came flying through, at which time he may have turned his back in a reflex, the bumper collided with his lower back, ejected him out of his shoes, tore his laces from the shoes, and then he landed 80 feet uphill from where he had been descending. Based on the position of his shoes and laces, it was argued he had been near the median when he was struck. I did a lot of research into hit-and-run accidents in relation to how far a body can be propelled when struck by a moving vehicle. Surprisingly, a vehicle doesn't have to be moving exceedingly fast to throw a body a decent distance. One particular study entitled Vehicle Impact Velocity Predictions from Pedestrians Thrown Distance said a truck or SUV-sized vehicle traveling at a speed of 37 miles per hour can throw a victim upwards of 88 feet. This would suggest that, had Russell been struck by a truck with oversized tires, it's certainly possible he could have been thrown the distance between where he was and where his shoes were found and the truck wouldn't have had to have been moving that fast. I don't think a lot of people argue that particular point, but instead note that he was knocked out of his shoes, his shoelaces were ripped out, and his socks came off. There's a couple of different factors involved in being knocked out of shoes, socks, and laces. What type of shoe, how tightly it was laced, what angle the pedestrian is struck at, and the speed of the vehicle hitting them. Based on photos of Russell's shoes, it appears they were low tops with metal eye stays through which the laces were passed. They looked kind of like boat shoes. Crime scene photos show one shoe upside down on the road and the other lying flat. However, the quarter of the shoe, the section which contains the eye stays, appeared torn on the left side of the shoe, resulting in the jagged fabric jutting upwards. Curiously, though, there are no signs of the fabric of the laces having been shredded through the metal rims of the eye stays. There doesn't appear to be any fabric clinging to them or the shoes themselves. It's certainly possible that Russell could have been struck by a vehicle which shot him out of his shoes. However, the laces do provide a reason to question. If he's hit and he's knocked out of his shoes, why is blood found on the laces? He'd be airborne quickly, likely not bleeding near his shoe. And even if he is bleeding already, the vehicle itself would have been over the shoes as he gets ejected out of them. 
I did find a few instances of pedestrians being struck by a vehicle with enough force to knock them out of their socks as well. So again, that's possible. However, the speeds related to creating enough force to knock someone out of their socks would have thrown Russell's body far further. Maybe this was impeded by the fact that he was thrown uphill, hitting the ground sooner than he would have on a flat road. Hitting the ground also raises a whole new assortment of questions. When a pedestrian is struck by a moving vehicle and thrown, they're going to slide at the point of impact. This sliding typically results in clothing being shredded and the side of the victim which makes impact being scraped up badly. But that didn't happen in this case. Russell's clothing wasn't shredded. There were no signs on his body of him having been scraped up by the pavement. That, in and of itself, seems bizarre. Now, if it is a hit-and-run accident, there's certainly an amount of anomalies which have to be considered. Sometimes people are struck and get thrown in the opposite direction. Sometimes the impact doesn't throw them, but instead scoops them up onto the hood of the vehicle. It's surely possible Russell could have been hit hard enough to leave his shoes behind, but instead of being thrown could have rolled up over the hood and then landed on the pavement where he was found. This case would require the vehicle to be moving at a much higher rate of speed, though. The fact is, while studies can show percentages and likelihoods, they can't account for those times where something defies all stats and becomes an outlier. The evidence which seems to contradict the hit-and-run decision most strongly is the blood. One would expect to find a pool of blood beneath Russell, and possibly some splatter at the point of impact, but that didn't happen here. Instead, near the point of impact, stretching out over 20 feet from the center of the road to the furthest from Russell to the side of the road closest, approximately 30 feet, there are three distinct pools of blood. These are not small pools. It's enough to be considered a puddle of blood. How does that blood end up in those three locations if we're talking about a hit and run which would have sent him flying over 80 feet in seconds? There's never been definitive answers on that. If he was hit, he gets thrown, he lands. There's no reason there should be puddles of blood that far from his body. This is a major part of what caused his parents to believe that there had to have been some kind of physical altercation. It isn't hard to imagine. Russell's accosted by unknown number of persons. They fight. He's beaten and blood is spilled. Maybe he tries to get away, gets up partway up the hill, and at that moment, those who were attacking him get back in their vehicle, drive towards him, and strike him, leaving him lying in the median. This case could surely be a combination of assault plus vehicular homicide. It isn't impossible to imagine. He's a big kid. He's got long legs. He's going to be running pretty fast. His injuries could be consistent with both a physical assault and being struck by a vehicle, but the order could be off. If Russell was assaulted and then hit with a vehicle, how would his shoes, laces, and socks end up where they were? Well, it's certainly possible that in the process of the attack, Russell either lost his shoes or they were taken off of him. Looking at the laces in the road, at least by the crime scene photos, they look knotted up or bunched up, almost like they're still tied when they're pulled from the shoe. I don't know about Spokane, but back in the 80s in New York, it was a fairly common practice for people to, after assaulting someone, remove their shoes not the laces, and then toss the shoes into a nearby power line. There were certainly power lines running along the side of this road, and while I can't say for sure, if indeed Russell was assaulted, it might explain his shoes being removed. At this point, it becomes a fairly direct question. Could we be dealing with a random hit and run, a random attack, or was Russell in particular targeted? We have the story about the note telling him to watch his back, though I don't know how much credit I can give it. How many kids get threatening notes from people that don't like them? I imagine it happens in schools across the country quite frequently, but it doesn't necessarily mean one of those people would be responsible. Not to mention he's in middle school, so it seems unlikely that note would have come from someone over the age of 14, certainly not someone who's already driving. While everyone interviewed has said Russell was very popular and didn't have a problem with anyone, that's probably not entirely true. Kids in school, no matter how popular they are, always have someone who doesn't like them. Now you're talking about a teenager who's over six feet tall and is just killing it on the basketball court. Would it be all that surprising if some older guy or guys had played with him at some point and were jealous of his skill? This is all speculative, but the point is, no matter how popular you can be, there's always going to be someone who has a problem with you. 
That just seems to be a fact of life. I don't think it's entirely possible to rule out a scenario where somebody specifically targeted Russell. He was hit a tenth of a mile from his house. It was known that he was out that night. It isn't hard to imagine someone could have known where he lived and was waiting for him in that area. Of course, it's also possible that this could have been completely random. Now, in reference to that Craigslist posting, in it the author tells a story that while Russell was walking, a vehicle pulled up next to him, they reached out, grabbed him, and hit the gas. A stupid and dangerous teen prank. However, in Russell's case, it went very wrong. His legs get pulled under one of the tires, his shoes are spun off and scraped up, and he's partially run over. While it's a compelling story, it gets a ton of details wrong. Russell was found up the hill, not at the bottom. His shoes were at the bottom, not the top. The damage to his legs was higher up in the thigh and near his hip, not lower, which would be expected if his legs got pulled under the tires. However, while the story may be remarkably inconsistent, it isn't necessarily completely wrong. It isn't hard to imagine someone could have been planning to do something like that to Russell and it went wrong. Maybe he fell over and they hit him. Maybe his shoes were ripped off when they did and slipped and he sustained major injuries. It's all guesswork in relation to that post, but I wouldn't be surprised if something like that happened. Remember, you're talking about a 6 foot 3 inch 13 year old. Someone coming up behind him, judging just purely on his height, might have guessed him to be older, and maybe they didn't know they were messing with the kid until it was too late, though the entire possibility is ridiculously stupid and dangerous, surely not something that should be done to any adult or child. We know TJ was accused of this, and frankly, just like in the case of Brian, TJ, if you're out there, I'd love to speak to you on or off the record. We also have that story from the mid-90s, the witness who spoke to Sandy Brewer and claimed to know who had killed Russell. In the witness report, this person said he'd gone too far and killed Russell, running him down. What became of that? Well, I'd really love to be able to dig into it, but there's almost nothing out there. Did the Spokane police go into this? Did they question the person accused? Unfortunately, there's nothing available to tell that story. However, it's surely an avenue that should have been investigated. Speaking of information related to this case, which hasn't been followed up, what about that DNA? If there is DNA evidence in this case, why the hell hasn't it been tested yet? It's just another frustrating piece of an already overwhelmingly frustrating case. There's far too many questions here and not enough answers for them. How do the laces separate from the shoes but also have blood on them? Why are there three pools of blood so far from Russell? Why is he struck in the back when he should have been walking towards the point of impact? Why is there no scraping on his clothes or body, which would have happened if he had been hit, thrown, and then slid across pavement? Why does the bruising on his face and arms appear to be made by fingers? Why are his own knuckles bruised up as if he'd been fighting? Why didn't police sample the blood and instead wash it away? What happened to his socks and how did those get taken off? There's really only one thing we know for certain. In the early morning hours of June 4th, 1989, a 13-year-old was killed in the middle of a busy street and 30 years later, no one seems to have any answers. Spokane police remain convinced that it was a hit and run. No gang activity, no beating, nothing other than someone flying down that road and striking Russell then fleeing the scene. Someone's watching from the side of the road and runs off and is never found, questioned, or provides any evidence about what may or may not have happened. Someone named Brian, the name Russell was calling out, calls the hospital to ask about his condition before anyone could possibly have known. There is enough here to stoke the flames of suspicion and to call everything into question. However, if you set everything aside, all of the evidence, all of the questions, you're left with one scenario. Someone killed a 13-year-old boy and for the past 30 years they've gotten away with it. They must have gotten their vehicle repaired and just continued on along without anyone being the wiser. A family was destroyed, a promising life was stolen, and now his sister remains as his sole advocate, taking up the fight her parents both fought until they passed away. Thirty years is a long time. If alive today, Russell would be turning 45 next month. What might he have done with his life? Electrical engineer? NBA player? Husband? Children? Family? We may never know. And unfortunately, unless someone comes forward with new evidence or new evidence is found, the mysterious death of Russell Evans will remain open, unsolved, and very cold.
If you're looking for more information about the mysterious death of Russell Evans, Unsolved Mysteries did a 15-minute segment on it, The Trail Went Cold did a mini-sode on it, and there are many forums and news articles available online to research. If you have any information about the mysterious death of Russell Evans, please contact the Spokane Police Department at 509-625-4100. What do you believe happened? Tweet me at TraceEvPod, email me at TraceEvidencePod at gmail.com, message me on Instagram at TraceEvidencePod, or comment in the Facebook group. There's a quick scheduling update. I'll be taking off next week, so the next episode of Trace Evidence will release on Tuesday, July 14th. However, I recently participated in an interview with Podcasts the Podcast hosted by Ariel, and that will be released on July 10th, so you should definitely check that out if you're missing your fill of listening to me babble. I'd like to take a moment now to thank our amazing Patreon producers, Alicia Lorraine, Anne M. Bertram, Astrid Maria Nair, Brett Eady, Brittany Bivens, Brian Kemmerling, Christine Greco, Krista Colvin, Diane Dyson, Eamon Brady, Emily Smith, Emma Vachon, Jessica Chagnon, Kevin Bonham, Megan Cotter, Michael Draves, Nick Mohar Schurz, Pamela Coburn, Quinn McBreen, Roberta Jansen, Sarah, Samantha Ford, Stephanie Eve, Stephen Wyland, Tara Doble, Tom Archer, Tracy Woods, and Travis Skepsko. You're all amazing and your contributions are greatly appreciated, as are all patrons. If you're interested in supporting Trace Evidence, please visit patreon.com slash trace evidence or visit trace-evidence.com for further information. That is going to wrap up episode 118. I want to thank you all for listening and I hope you'll join me next week for another unsolved case on the next episode of Trace Evidence. Trace Evidence.